Welcome to the Non-Essential Podcast. I'm Steve Gibson. I'm Ben Matlock. And uh, we've got another show, another yeah. week, another yeah. stuff. You, you can, you're kind of bringing your NPR voice this week. I, I yeah, I'm trying. I'm sitting like extra close to the microphone, and you're, you're like triple slouched. And yeah, you're just, yeah. <laughs> but you've basically done a backflip in your chair, and you're on your neck right now. Um, <laughs> just chill as fuck. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we need some chill after the last couple of weeks, but. Yeah, um, okay. and this is the place for chill. A non-essential <laughs> podcast, get your chill. If we had a radio station, it'd be 97.3, The Chill. The Chill. Uh, yeah, so if you haven't listened to the non-essential podcast before, every week me and Steve get together and tell each other weird fucking shit. Sometimes it's a history story, sometimes it's trivia, sometimes it's myths. Uh, there's really no... Uh, we don't really have any umbrella for this shit. Like, we just sort of tackle whatever interests us. Um, last week, we talked about tattoos because I got tattooed. And now it's healing, so now it's really fucking gross. So and now it, you're going to talk about scabs. Yeah. Uh, how would you like to hear about skin peeling? <laughs> um, <laughs> it started in... Nah. Um, and then we talked about whatever you did. Um I, stuff. I, I actually forgot <laughs> Rudolph Fence, the time traveler that never actually existed of course right but... that, yeah that guy that that guy that didn't happen that's why I forgot yeah because it wasn't real. real I dreamed it um this week I'm kind of bringing a downer of a story uh <laughs> I, I think Yay. we I think we did a pretty good job uh lightening things up for a while and not talking about like the worst fucking monsters in the world skin falling uh, off yes. after your friends fell in ice crevices and yeah um acid bath murders that kind of stuff right uh you know you we we did talk about mr rogers so that's close but um <laughs> no <laughs> uh but today I, i'm i'm not gonna lie i'm talking about some real fucking monsters here so if you're like it's a serial killer story. Um, if you're sensitive to that type of shit, uh, sorry, this might not be the episode to listen to. Uh, but then again, maybe none of them are. Um, but see, the problem, my stuff's kind of cool. It's it's not like uplifting, but it's cool and it's a good story. So maybe we should stick do... <laughs> through the serial killer stuff to get to to mine. To the creamy goodness. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get around the hard knife candy shell (laughs) but yeah like you know i've kind of talked about it before on this show like we've talked about uh when talking about some of these pieces of shit uh we've talked about like capital punishment and stuff and like i've kind of made my stance on that pretty clear where it's like i i don't kill them all let god sort them out right uh fires for everyone is usually how i approach any crime uh, no, like I, I'm pretty anti death penalty. Um, mostly not even out of like, we have to, uh, human life is sacred, but more out of like, uh, our justice system is very impractical and, uh, inaccurate at times. And I just don't feel comfortable. I dare you to find one instance where the court charged somebody that was innocent. Yeah. That'll be tough. <laughs> I'll, we'll turn in next week when I try to find a case like that. <laughs> So, like, I, you know, I'm pretty, like, I, I don't want people killed uh, just in case there is a chance that someone was innocent. It's like, you know, even if they spend their whole lives in jail, I feel better about that fuck up versus, like, ending their lives completely. And that's how I've always kind of approached uh, the idea, the argument of the death penalty. Today's story, as I was, like, kind of doing the research on it, it was really, like, pushing my, like, as really pushing that kind of mercy I have in me. Um, and, and most serial killer stories will tend to do that when you get into right. like what they did. And so, and this one was really kind of, especially how it ends where it's like, you really feel like these guys like really didn't get what they should have gotten. Um, so let's get into it. It's because it's fun times. Uh, <laughs> Wolfgang Abel, was born in January 3rd, uh, 1959 in Dusseldorf, West Germany. Uh, he was, okay. I was, I was going to stop you for a second and say, 
who the fuck's named Wolfgang in 1959, but Germany, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Hang yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, so he was raised in the wealthy uh, Veronese suburb of Monte Rico, which means Mountain of the Rich. So <laughs> Wolfgang Abel is actually his name. He's actually from Dusseldorf, which sounds like a fucking Harry Potter town. Um, <laughs> and he's from an area called the Mountain of the Rich. So starting off well. Yeah, so no, nobody could come out of there fucked up. No. Uh, he graduated uh, from university with honors in mathematics, and he took a job in his adulthood at his father's insurance company. Um, Mario Furlan was born on April 1st, 1960, in Padua, Italy. His family lived in a well-off suburb. His father was chief of plastic surgery for that hospital's burn unit and was a prominent figure in their community. Uh, Furlan would end up growing up graduating with a degree in physics. Um, so the two of them actually met at a pretty young age and just stayed in contact all through uh, their education. Um, so the, like they were friends uh, pretty much their entire lives. Uh, Which is really fucking weird to me because like growing up, like, you know, I've I had friends in school that, you know, would be from a different area or they'd move away. And it's like, you just forget them. You don't stay in contact. Right. I have, I have, you know, friends that like I was tied to the hip with that I could just like message on Facebook and I won't do that. Right. And, and these people like they had to like write letters and fucking use the phone and shit. And it's like. Dearest Wolfgang. Like, you you know how many friends I wouldn't have if we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> um, so the two had much in common. So academically, uh, obviously, with their like they were very intelligent and successful. And like many, quote, smart people, because when you're academically smart, it doesn't actually mean you're like a practical person or an, right, like right. an intelligent person. That just means you're good at, you know, doing well on tests and shit. Um, so they were easily bored and they had one other thing in common, which is that they were neo-Nazi fucking psychos who <laughs> could only satisfy their boredom with serial killing. Yeah, well... It's it's important to have things in common with your bestie. You're right. It's, you know, so I, I think it's important to remember the next time somebody is bragging about their grades or some shit, they're probably a serial killer. No. I'd like to know, like, how that conversation went with they met. Like, yeah, like, I'm I'm rich. It's like, cool. I'm good at engineering or whatever you said. <laughs> you know like, what cool. we should do? Club some people. Like, yeah, you just imagine the conversation was really awkward. And then the one was like, man really love killing people and they're just like me too and then it like that's yeah like, like how do you yeah how do you get from a to b there um <laughs> but yeah so just remember like these monst monstrous dipshits i'm about to talk about did really well in school it, like it doesn't mean anything to do well in school if like all that intelligence is just there to like justify garbage bullshit that you already want to believe anyway right and these people are totally, like, it's kind of relevant with everything going on, especially in America today, um, you know, to kind of remember that. It's like, because you see a lot of people from, like, who have to, the, like, take these horrific stances, and then they'll throw up, like, professors and stuff who support what they're saying. And it's like, it, that actually doesn't mean anything, because you can be a professor and still be a colossal dipshit. Yeah, it's weird how people and i like to say our society but really it's throughout history where it's like if somebody is academically gifted or does well in business or just is fucking born into money and has it like they might not have even done anything to get it people tend to be like well they know something that we don't and they're a good person and it's frankly it's quite often the the opposite of right. that. yeah totally um so their first crime was in rome in early august 1977 uh, where they burned a male gypsy to death inside of a car for, quote, being a drug addict. Uh, I, I, They probably didn't know that. They probably just wanted to fucking kill well, the guy. Well, it's probably one of those things where they just feel like all gypsies are... Yeah. You know, we I say we do it. Me and you don't, or at least we try very hard not to, but, like, people today with the racist stereotypes, and they're like, well, he's Mexican, so he's a rapist. And it's like, wait... How yeah. did you? That's all the proof that they need that this gypsy is a drug addict. That's that'd be my guess. Yeah, like. yeah being different, and then, and then you can just put them in any category you want. Uh, they used four Molotov cocktails, uh, but surprisingly, the victim did live long enough to tell the police 
uh, he believed a third man was involved, although that was never substantiated upon. As far as we know, it's probably pretty hard to like get a great idea of exactly what's going on when there's two people fucking throwing Molotovs. Yeah, when you're you. like cars on fire and you're in it, like you're probably not going to have the most accurate picture of what right. just happened. Um, but he didn't die right away, so there, you know, that that's the first. We're gonna do a fun quote, well, quote fun, not actually fun <laughs> thing where we'll keep track of all these deaths. So that's their first victim. Uh, later that same month, they burned a transient man to death, uh, Garriano Spinelli, is his name. For not being a drug guy. Who like... had been sleeping in the city center. He was yeah. a transient, so fuck him, right? Uh, there's two. Um, around that time, three similar murders were committed, but they weren't able to completely link them to Abel and Ferlin. Uh, so I want to know what the fuck was going on there where firebomb <laughs> serial killings were common. Yeah. Um, you know, it, like, cause all, at this point, all they've used is fire. So, um, yeah, you'd like to think one firebomb death would raise a flag like, uh Oh, something's really bad going on here. And like to have so many of them that they're like, we're not even sure if these are related. Yeah, <laughs> let's not, you know, we don't want to stir up the public. They might think there Although, may be a problem in the community. That kind of goes back to the, um, what was it? Was it all this shit blends together because our world's such a crap hole right now. But the uh, package bombs out in Texas, I think it was, right. earlier, either this year or last year, where the same fucking thing where they're like, hold on now. Just because these packages keep going off in the same neighborhood, we're not saying they're the same person. Right. uh, Or or linked to the same source in any way. Like, yeah. Um, So next year in December, the two bludgeoned a homosexual waiter, uh, Luciano Stefanato. uh, Then they stabbed him 34 times. So it's like, like and when you read these like types of stories, there's always shit like that where it's like, what the fuck we did it 33 times and but we just weren't sure like well it's and it's like there's always like the bludgeoning first and they're like oh that that it's like when you want a cheeseburger and then you have like a philly cheesesteak instead and you're like that didn't get the craving at all let's grab a knife right like, and you know it's when you read like the details of the crimes and you like you kind of list it out like that is you get into what i'm gonna be kind of talking about at the end where it's like you just don't feel like these guys got what they should have gotten um almost a full year later they stabbed another man claudio costa for being a quote drug addict uh this is starting to become like the worst holiday tradition friends could possibly have (laughs) Uh, they just wait till december and then fucking kill a guy um in early 1980 they stabbed a casino employee to death uh so they're at five victims now uh, Did they have any reasoning on that one or just like maybe gambling's like bad or he was different? Yeah. Um, they, I didn't get too much details about who that casino employee was. Uh, December that same year, they used an axe and a hammer to murder a prostitute, Alice Maria Beretta. So we're at six. At this point, I typed out, I fucking hate these guys. Yeah, and their methodology seems to be getting more personal, but like more slop. Like, I don't say sloppy is the wrong word, like more just. I don't know. I was going to say more brutal, but it, it, again, firebombing is pretty fucking horrific. Like, right. Um, and, and it's kind of after this point, they kind of go back to the fire. Like, I guess they think that's their thing. Um, it's so like, but it, it does look like they, you know, they wanted to do more intimate uh, right. killing, which is totally known to happen with serial killers. They'll, change shit up until they find something they like um in may 1981 they set fire to the tower of verona's porta san san giorgio uh which is a medieval gate from the year 1321 so at this point they're just fucking destroying history along with people um luca take that tower luca martinotti a student was caught in the blaze and killed cool Uh, so yeah uh, July 1982 at the Sanctuary of Madonna di Monte Barico, which is a shrine, uh, two elder, elderly friars, uh, Mario Lovato and Giovanni Battista Pagato, were killed by numerous ham and hammer blows. 
So we're at nine fucking victims now. At the death of the friars, the police found a leaflet at the scene. It espoused a bunch of Nazi propaganda and was signed Ludwig above the Nazi eagle and classic Nazi symbol. Um, these leaflets would become their calling card for every following victim, or they would. I like that they wait till almost ten victims to be like, wait, maybe we should like make known our like yeah ideology. Like, what are they? Yeah, what are you doing it for? Um, right. You know, it, and it's because. Like most psychopaths, they probably didn't actually know. They probably filled in the gaps in their reasoning later on. Right. Because um, really, when it comes down to it, like, serial killing is just an inherently selfish... They wanted to kill. And selfish then thing, yeah. Use it, right. Um, like, you're not doing it for any real reason beyond it makes you feel good and powerful in that moment. Um and you and you're a fucking monster. What Ben's saying, kids, is f- killing it feels great. Like yeah, you become Spider Man with everything, but only no. in that moment. So you have to keep doing it more and more frequently. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the message of the show. You got it. <laughs> um, so these leaflets uh, would become their calling card for every following victim. Or they would mention their reasonings. Uh, Often it would be as vague as the person needed to be eliminated. Or they would just say they were drug addicts, homosexuals, or prostitutes. God, imagine being a drug-addicted homosexual prostitute. Yeah, you're fucking target number one. Like, (laughs) uh, Like, it's funny to me that, like, this is always... These are always the same people that serial killers go after. It's funny to me that their targets are never serial killers or Nazis... (laughs) <laughs> um, like they're never even in the top three of what they think is ruining the world. Right. Well, and a lot of that though goes back to like, they're different and people want to, I don't know. We could go like in a whole episode of like psychology and, and yeah. that stuff where it's like, they just need to pick out somebody to feel better than, which is fucking weird to me when you're already like better educated and have more money than most people that yeah. you still need to act like, well, I, I need something to feel more superior. Well, it's often people with like those kind of uh, privileges that like they often on some level, they know they had that privilege. So they like they're more miserable because of it, um, because they didn't really have to build what they had. Like the fucking one guy has his job at his dad's insurance company. Um, which is a sweet gig let me tell you and but it, like what did he go to school for was it something he was actually pa- passionate about you know like it wasn't it was he, he went to school Serial for something killing. sort of gen- generic and like he, oh that's not that wasn't his major was how to kill random people. right yeah the mathematics of you know <laughs> 10 victims plus two equals yeah um but like they always target like these people who are already at society's lowest points and they try to justify it saying like we're getting rid of the people who are destroying the world but it really it's like you're going after the people that the cops have the hardest time chasing down you know like right well and the ones that you're going to get away it, it, it's sucky as it is you kill homeless people and they're not going to investigate it quite as hard as they're going to if you like right. go kill affluent people yeah, it, Which you is know, bullshit, you, but it's the truth. That's that's how serial killers tend to get away with their sprees. Right. If you look at any like serial killing case where it's like they're going after like call like women in college or something is like that always got way more priority than like a string of like prostitute killings or something. Right. And it, it was it was partially because it is damn difficult to like you know trace down some, like somebody who's working the streets. But also, you like you know, there wasn't an emphasis to, uh, like it, it's one of the fucked up things about our society. You know, it was it's weird like reading this because like there are no good serial killer motivations. Like I said, it's just an inherently like one of the most fucking selfish behaviors I think humans have ever uh, have ever committed to. Um, but the like we're cleaning up the world stance is like the one i probably hate the most uh because like there are serial killer stories where it's like you like when they get arrested or whatever they're pretty open about like yeah i just did it because i wanted to yeah i mean that's what i was about to say there's some that are that will just admit that they're 
psychopaths and it's, I just wanted to kill or I just liked to kill or yeah but it's the people who like think they were like on a crusade that like I really oh I hate it yeah because they they've considered themselves these like heroes and then I don't know we'll go <laughs> Oh, well, let you get to where it's going, but a lot of them, like when they get caught, then act like they're martyrs. Yeah, like, and and you like and for fucking anything, we're seeing it more and more now. You can turn anything into a crusade, and some fucking group of idiots will follow you. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so with the uh, the Ludwig leaflet, cops finally had a moniker to attach to these murders, but the murders would continue now at a faster pace than the. Uh, faster pace than they had before the death of the friars. Sure, because now they've got uh, notoriety and attention. Right. So February 26, 1983, they attacked Mario Bison, a priest they believed was a homosexual. Um, this is really fucked up and brutal. Uh, la- last chance to turn our show off and never listen to it again. Uh, they drove a nail into his forehead and then like smashed it in further uh, with a crucifix bearing all. Um, hmm. so like it was, we're at 10 fucking victims now. Uh, and now they're really like kind of embracing, like making a big show about it. May of that same year, they decided to escalate beyond the death of just one person at a time. Uh, they each carried a large bag into a red light adult cinema and sat down in the back of the theater. When the lights went down, they pulled out containers of gas and poured down the sloped floor. As they exited, they lit the fumes, and an estimated three dozen people ended up hospitalized for burns and smoke inhalation. Five people inside and one passerby who ran in to help died of their injuries in the hospital. Sixteen fucking people. So, it, cool. it, like, yeah. It, fuck these guys. Oh, I hate them. <laughs> I don't know I'm why curious, I curious, though, how you sneak in bags of gasoline, like... Because I could use that same trick to get, like, Coca-Cola yeah, into the theater. I but... could fucking eat, eat Wendy's and watch a movie. Imagine. Right. Uh, following this, the Ansa di Milano news agency received the next Lud- Ludwig leaflet taking credit for the fire. Uh, quote, We claim the burning of the Cox. A death squad executed men without honor, disrespectful of Ludwig's law. The leaflet gave an information only the perpetrators could know, confirming it was the two of them. Uh, January 1984, they poured gasoline onto the floor of the crowded Liverpool disco, uh, which was in Munich. The fire killed a maid, uh, Tartarati Corinne, and 40 other people were injured and maimed. So it's cool how people that the ones that seem to keep dying are ones that have nothing to do with this crusade, and it was like. Like it's just with the theater, it's a guy that. Well, I know there was. You said a couple of the people that were in it too, but like somebody that ran in to help and a maid. It's not even somebody that if you're if you're trying to make the argument like all oh, these heathens at this discotheca, like right. But if you're trying to help the heathens, then you are a heathen. Uh, yeah, and that's you know the philosophy of every fucking monster in history. Um, so March 1984, this is the last one I. I swear, as far as their crimes go, there's more to the story. Um, the two fuckers go to a larger disco that was holding a masquerade ball. Uh, they dressed up as Perrault, a famous uh, lonesome mime character from, of French origin. Shows up in a lot of plays and stuff like that. Uh, they entered the party, each carrying their bags of gas containers, but bouncers recognized them for who they were almost immediately. Articles say they were subdued, uh, before they had the chance to start the, another fire, and I like to believe they got fucked up by the. I was gonna say because I, I imagine like most of these kinds of people that one on one in a confrontation were big fucking like wusses, right? Like, and, and like you got an entire crowd of people now who know what you came in here to do, um, and know what you have done in the past, right? So like I'm surprised that they they left the scene alive, but like I want like some roadhouse shit where like they're being thrown through tables and stuff uh according to reports the party goers really wanted to fucking kill the pair oh sure um, but the police were able to arrive and like arrest them before the disco mob got to them <laughs> the, I, disco I, mob I, being my uh my favorite band name right yeah uh, <laughs> that that was actually mine I i really wish the newspapers used that Pretty much caught red-handed, the two did the sensible thing and claimed the cops were framing them. 
<laughs> their trials took about two months from December 1986 to near the end of January 1987. They were found guilty of 10 of the 15 murder charges that were brought against them, dating back to 1982. But the court did declare them partially insane, which negated the option of life sentences. What? So, so this is, yeah, this yeah. is coming from Mr. Not for the death penalty because morality, blah, blah, blah. Well, and I, like, could, I could see like the insane defense, like negating the death penalty, but like, right. If you're insane, you're not going to get uninsane. So, like, how does that, like, what's the, when they made that rule, what was the reasoning? Be like, well, if you're homicidally insane, it's not really your fault. So, you should be able to go back. Like, yeah. Get, like, I, I'm so, you, you know now, like, we've talked about this type of shit enough over the years. Like, you know how I am about this shit. I'm saying this is a real bad system. To say, yes. like, at some point they have to get out is like, no, they don't. If they're that fucking crazy, like, you owe society to keep them locked up. They appealed the, uh, their sentence, of course, and due to, due to their status and wealth, this, this shit will really piss you off um, if you're anything like me. Due to their status and wealth, they were released on bail into, quote, open custody which is basically um, being free as long as you keep checking in on time until the appeal is over. That makes a lot of fucking sense when you've killed 16, more than, I, I forget the number you've already given, but... We're at 17 people. 17 people. And what... But I, it's like, well, but we're sure because you're rich, you'll probably obey the law, even though you've not done so to the yeah. extremist... Con you you fuck brutally fucking murdered people and injured countless others, and you were going to do it again. Um, I, all I can think is that the judge was, if he was being honest, he said, "Well, this makes no sense whatsoever." But your father just gave me a shitload of money, and yeah. I want to buy a new car. There had to have been some sort of fucking wealth factor in there. So hopefully, the judge is the next one that these two execute yeah. to purge this. <laughs> um. So they were on appeal. Abel moved to Mestrino and kept a pretty low profile throughout the process. Um, Ferlin moved to uh, Casal di Scadocia. Um, Scadocia. Yeah, which is a great word. But on February 1st, 1991, he fled the country. He told authorities that he simply rode his bike to a train that was bound for Australia or Austria and then used public transportation to cross the then Yugoslavia all the way to Greece. He doctored his license and ID card to change his surname and worked as a tour operator and translator for nearly three years. How fucking creepy would that be to find out? They were like, oh, yeah, we went on a vacation to Greece and we had this tour operator. Oh, he, he was knew just so the neatest much. guy. <laughs> and then there, there was a famous fire over there, uh, if you look to your right. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> Yeah, it's a little weird how he kept, like, muttering under his breath, burn fuckers I'll burn. burn this but... fucking bus to the ground, I swear to God. Yeah. It, it was... I just assume his English was a little off. Right. Uh, so two tourists, uh, I guess, you know, I don't know how, maybe a fucking documentary was on or something the night before. Uh, they recognized him, and they gave footage of him to the authorities, but before they could arrest him, he fled again. It was probably pretty obvious when they're like, sticking the camera up in the guy's face like oh we're just filming you for no reason hey you ever kill anyone hey hey mister yeah like and then he was like actually um by 1994 ferlin had found his way to the island of crete where he worked at a rent-a-car agency um but authorities finally tracked him down there and arrested him uh in his apartment he had a shit ton of money that was in various currencies like we're it, the, the article I'll link uh, on in the show's description uh, breaks it all down what currencies and some of them are no longer currencies at all but we're talking fucking millions by today's standards which he obviously wasn't making as a he, tour guy he or claimed, a place, so he claimed he earned it all by working yeah I'm in the wrong fucking line of work then right rent a car you, you can be a millionaire in a year um, it's, you know, that means that daddy was funneling money to him, but he was trying to protect, you know. Well, it's interesting you said that because uh, as recently as 2001, authorities were still investigating where this money had come from. Uh, 
some people suggest it was simply just aid from family, but others suspect he was receiving help from the extreme Hellenic right, which is what we were talking about is you get a fucking following no matter but like see, what you're trying to do. And, and, and that's so fucking mind boggling to me. Not just that you get the following, but then the people are like, we'll just give you millions of dollars. It's like, you're a fuck hero. that. Like he, yeah, yeah, even if there's somebody I like, like I like Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters, but if they have a choice to give somebody millions of dollars, like I'd rather have it myself. That's the thing. <laughs> like that's the thing, though. They think you're a hero for the cause. Like they bought into the fucking shit you're selling, or you bought into their shit, and it's like if you go that far for them, you know, like the, you, there there's a real fucked up loyalty among pieces of shit. So ten days after he had fled the court held up his sentence of 27 years so maybe he was right to flee until you figure out that uh you know how this ends so shortly after being thrown in prison Ferlin attempted suicide but lived uh and then in january 2009 he was released just he's just released (laughs) sure he's done his time now he supposedly lives and works in milan 17 fucking people died Wolfgang Abel, who was just as much of a piece of shit, but at least didn't run, wouldn't get released until 2013. So, so his family just didn't have as much money to buy off the Fucking, judges. I guess. Like, yeah, I don't think either one of them should have gotten out, but... No, ever. Ever. Fucking ever. Like, I don't think either one should have gotten out, but the fact that Ferlin got out first is also <laughs> just like, what yeah, the fuck boggling. is going on in Italy like what were you guys doing and and i don't see how you kill 17 people like in a single act like the um and i i don't remember the number of deaths but the colorado theater shooter jackass that like i tend to not remember these people's names cuz they don't deserve that anyway but 17 people over years is a whole lot different than like i went insane and made one like horrific act like that's a calculated long term right there's no amount of prison time i don't that can that can change you from that being that person yeah it, it, like that was the thing like this was a not not only is the subject matter really rough um this week but like just reading that like there's not really there's no happy ending to a serial killer story but the fact that it's just as like well you did the time you know, like, <laughs> right. It's like, no, you fucking didn't. The second moral of the story is if you're going to do crime, go to Italy. <laughs> Apparently, if you're even a little bit insane, they will guarantee you'll get out of here, friend. Yeah. And I mean, me and you are covered because we've got eight years worth of podcasts that we can submit as evidence. That right. Like, oh, fuck. These these yeah. guys not only don't need to do any time, but man, let's give them some money. If they weren't crazy before, they sure as shit are at the end of this. They've been talking to themselves for eight years. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the story of fucking Abel and Ferlin. Uh, I, I, you know, nice. I now I'm mad. Yeah, I'm in a bad mood now. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Start your it's Tuesday for everyone listening. Start your week off the right way. <laughs> uh, With the darkest of fucking people and how the justice system failed everyone else. Yeah. All right. Well, my stuff this week is not. Uh, I guess my stuff is cool. I think at least I I really enjoyed reading it's about cool. it. Uh, plus, it kind of really fits. It's it's October, so like I when I came across this, I was like, this is super appropriate. Um, cause I, for one had never heard of the night witches who at the height of world war two and through its conclusion, harassed and terrified German soldiers, particularly along the Soviet front. So like when I, when I first like read, read the, that phrase, I said, I thought, you know, it's not a secret that Hitler and like the Nazis in general were obsessed with like the occult. Uh, but the night witches were not the occult. They were actually entirely of this earth uh no shit. so yeah yeah <laughs> so but I, what i mean is unlike last week where i presented you a fake thing as a real thing these are real things that i'm talking about and uh, real people um but at the start of the war the soviets like many nations banned women from fighting in the conflict 
Uh, but women did serve in the war. Uh, for the most part, they were restricted to like support type roles, like supply lines and all sorts, you know, factory work and whatever it, it, things that they considered not like front lines combat, but you know, still part of the war effort. Um, but particularly with the Soviet Union, really like any European country over there, uh, that still often led to them seeing battle. Um, so it wasn't that w- women fighters were, you know, unheard of, but officially women weren't combatants. Right. Um, but that changed sometime in or somewhat in 1941, uh, when at the urging of a uh, Marina Raskova, um, you'll you'll get some really bad uh, Russian accents from me throughout this. But uh, anyway, Marina, you know, who was basically like the Soviet's Amelia er- uh, Earhart. Um, convinced Stalin uh, to deploy three squadrons of female fighter pilots. So the fi- the 588th squadron had been a regiment of all female pilots that was already like in existence prior to this, uh, but they'd been running like supply runs and that kind of stuff. Uh, but they were reissued and turned into the 588th night bomber regiment. Um, but just because the women were now officially combatants, it didn't mean that they were accepted by basically the, anybody. Uh, they certainly weren't treated as equals. Uh, they were issued hand-me-down men's uniforms that often didn't fit, and they were given dangerous missions because they were, uh, frankly, they considered them expendable. Um, because they only flew at night, uh, they also were forced to fly an outdated aircraft with open, open cockpits, and they wore these like terrible used uniforms. They would also face like frostbite in addition to, of course, German fire. It's a goddamn um, Mad Max club, okay. pretty much. And that's what was so like badass about these women is it's like we want to fight, and they're like, okay, fine, here's a stick, and they're like, fuck yeah, oh, bring man, it on, Nazis. Kill so many people with this stick. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, uh, their planes had no navigational equipment, meaning that the pilots would be guided. You know, they only flew at night, and all they had were paper maps and, like, eyesight, like, landmarks and stuff, which, you know, in 1940s World War II, there wasn't a whole lot of, like, guiding beacons at night. Um, Other great the, band. <laughs> guiding, guiding beacons. Guiding beacons or beacons at night. At night. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they flew... Plywood and canvas Polycarpov, I think that's it, Polycarpov U2s, um, which were mostly like retrofitted crop dusters, or they were planes that, you know, this model was used for crop dusting or like training uh, because they oh, were man, made of someone's wood. Someone's getting dusted with this. <laughs> Take that. You're going to grow really fucking big, <laughs> suckers. Um, because they were made of wooden cloth, the plane hit by the phosphorus tracer rounds would often immediately erupt into flame. So that's a cool feature. Fucking um, terrifying. <laughs> right. Like, you not to... only can you see the tracer rounds coming at you, but you know if they clip you, it's just like, yep, I'm a ball of fire now. You're going to be one hell of a pilot or you're done. Like, right. <laughs> those are your options. The, in fact, these airplanes were like so underpowered that they often had to fly very low and they couldn't even carry parachutes because they couldn't afford the extra weight. So that's really cool, to, to too. To be fair, that's like a Battlefield game, and that's way more scary than a plane <laughs> like way high in the air is one that's like about your height. Yeah, it clips the top of your head off with its prop, and you're like, oh, fuck, I didn't even see it coming. Right. Um, each plane could only hold two bombs, so they often ran eight or more missions per night. You'd have to drop your two bombs and then go back and get more, and then they're like, get back out there. But if there's a um, number attached to it, again, that's another thing that's scary. It's like, all right, you know two are coming tonight, but you don't know when <laughs> or where. <laughs> anyway, you got to love the one who's that, like, you know, just one of them figured out how to carry a third bomb so that the Nazis were like, Poof, one, Poof, yeah. two, ah, <laughs> oh, we're safe. Near, Poof, fuck, near, three. Near the end of the war, it's like, all right, we're out of bombs. I knew it. And then the last one. <laughs> but uh, so they had a lot stacked against them, but they were also really fucking brave and had a lot of ingenuity. Um they were able to find ways to use their weaknesses like actually to their advantages and one of the big ones is that these crappy ass airplanes that were so slow and couldn't carry anything were actually so much slower than all of Germany's planes that they actually flew slower than the minimum stall speeds of the enemy's 
planes and it actually it made it really hard for the german pilots to like fight them in like skirmish combat if they <laughs> if they hit the brakes they actually go back in time <laughs> right the red baron's just like i got this woman in my where the fuck did she go son of a bitch so like i loved that like picture these planes that are just like putting along and they're just like every, enemies ha 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 and then you like try to slow down to shoot them down and all of a sudden your plane just falls out of the fucking sky because physics doesn't even support that <laughs> their uh, most famous tactic included sending a lead plane in which often had no ammunition at all of its own as bait and that would of course attract the uh, spotlights on the ground from the German forces which would light up the target so this lean plane would drop a flare, you know, once that they were being lit up and shot at with no way to shoot back, they'd fly over the target that they could now see and drop a flare and then hopefully get the fuck out of there. But slowly because they can't go fast. Yeah, that's that's horrifying. But what would happen is the tailing planes would then know where the target was. So they would fly in and they were able to actually cut the power to their engines because their planes were so light and then they could glide over the target silently and drop their bombs. Um, so once the engines were cut, the only clue that the Germans had that the planes were even there was the whooshing sound that they made as they like glided through the air. Which is kind of terrifying to me that you'd be in war, but it would be quiet enough to just hear... Like I think we can all picture just the sound of a big object moving through space. Like You just get that... <sighs> Feel. It's almost yeah. a feeling more than a sound, but that's all they could get. And that makes it really hard to target and shoot these things. Um, it was a sound that they likened to that of a witch's broom. And so they began calling them the Nocthexen, which is night witches. That's where the names came from. I, I was really hoping that they actually would dress up as witches and which is scare. And they probably it would did. Be, it like, would be it, a great October thing. It's just like, hey, Nazis, boo. <laughs> I'm gonna get you and your little Nazi dog too. <laughs> they would leave fucking cauldrons around camp. It was fucking terrifying. <laughs> but uh, the best kind of like nicknames to get, like, because if you just called yourselves the Night Witches because you're a bunch of like women that flew around at night, and it's like that's kind of cool, right? But when you were terrifying the fucking Nazis because they couldn't, all they could hear was a swooshing sound, and then you blew them the fucking like pieces, yeah. like that makes it really like an extra cool when thing the like nazis like give you your nickname like it becomes way cooler like if they had just named themselves the night witches that sounds like a roller derby team and that's not <laughs> right that's not nearly as cool or badass as like we fucking destroyed the nazis with really like earning it out of pain. fear yeah yeah so most of the night witches were women in their teens and 20s um and throughout the war a total of 261 women served in the uh, 588th, uh, which the regiment itself would go through a number of actual names and they would get really long and stupid because you know how the military gets. Um, but, you know, the night witches are basically what they, they, they wore that moniker pretty proudly. Uh, out of the 261 women that served in the regiment, only 32 died, which 32 is a lot of deaths. But yeah. given like if, if you've ever read anything about world war ii or any major wars if that percentage of your unit comes out alive that's pretty damn good yeah you'll take that on any call of duty map <laughs> <laughs> yeah kill, kill death ratio is way up there yeah man it's fucked up that that's our frame of reference for reference, like yeah. one of the worst global yeah. conflicts but but that's how it happened i think like yeah. it's exactly like the video yeah. game 10 minutes skirmishes in really tiny areas and then nothing sucked more than getting like dropped off of a supply like ship or something and dying and having to wait 30 minutes to respawn. Man, I really I think like hearing this story. I want the night wish night witches in a fucking video game. Women I, didn't fight in world wars though. It didn't happen. Turns out they did it better than anyone else fighting in that war. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. And I did make a note out of the 32 deaths. They said most of them were for being shot down or crashing. Makes sense. And they said, or tuberculosis. Like, fuck. Oh, come like, on. Like, how much would that suck? Like, I court death every night in my slow fucking goddamn gas covered plane, but I'm going to die from tuberculosis? Fuck that. Nice. But it makes sense because they're up at like freezing to death in these. I mean, it talked about how they'd get like frostbite. If you like stuck your head out of the cockpit to look down to try to find your target, you'd get like. Your nose would instantly freeze, you know, that kind of shit. It's like, yeah, yeah it was not a glamorous yeah, it turns out cockpits position. are important. 
Uh, throughout the war, they'd carry out a total of 23,672 missions. So again, if you look at those numbers, say 32 deaths out of... <laughs> that's almost like only one death per thousand missions. Yeah, that's fucking nuts. They dropped 3,000 tons of bombs and 26,000 incendiary shells. Um, while the unit was originally intended to be all female, they did eventually get some male mechanics, a male driver, and some male searchlight operators. Which I just loved, because, you know, you had this, like I said, the unit really, like, it, it talked about a general that when he got assigned, this unit got assigned to a particular theater or front or whatever, and he's like, you sent me, I wanted soldiers, and you sent me these women? It's like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to do more than you're going to do. So then these men, you know, they're they're doing well, and they, they, they're they feared by all the Nazis, and the men show up, and they're like, we're here to join this awesome regiment. They're like, cool, here's a plane arc. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to shine some fucking flashlights into the sky. Yeah. Like, flying around with bombs is women's to, work. To be fair, I, if I were the women in that situation, I, it would it would be kind of the, it would finally be turnaround or turnabout for them where it's like, I don't trust you to handle these planes. Right. We've been dealing with them forever. You know that if they handle gave the one lights. of these crappy ass planes to one of these like cocky male pilots, he'd it, it, proceed to like blow up the whole fucking airfield by accident. Like, right. <laughs> He'd be like, watch this, ladies. I'm going to do a barrel roll. Oh, crap. <laughs> Fucking but, dude uh, needs to learn how to work a wrench <laughs> before he can handle, like, the most dangerous plane you could fly in a war. <laughs> so, technically, there were some men in the regiment, but really all the the fighting was done by the female pilots. Um, as an example of the kinds of bravery displayed by the witches, I found a story. Uh, in 1943, there were two women were on a routine patrol over a Soviet railway station, when they encountered a squadron of 42 German bombers, um, they did the only sensible thing when, like, you come across a squadron that has you outnumbered 21 to 1, and they decided to engage the enemy aircraft in combat. Uh, <laughs> needless to say, they were severely outgunned, but they, however, they were able to use their maneuverability to their advantage and actually took down two of the bombers. Their maneuverability. Um, I just imagine these women, like, working like they're in constant bullet time <laughs> well yeah they you if you've ever seen like the women's gymnastics floor routine you it makes sense they could they just translated that into these like flying airplanes or doing like pirouettes <laughs> these and shit fucking airplanes that have like two planks of wood and a box and the whole time there's a big ribbon streaming behind them saying two for one sale at crazy eddie's mattresses or something like that but <laughs> it was the best we could find on short no notice go get them witches <laughs> But they took down two of the planes, which I imagine in the grand scheme of things, like two out of 42, it's like you really didn't change the Germans like mission on that run. But you also were probably did instill some terror in them where it's like, geez, these two fucking crazy women just like they're coming at us. They won't stop. Um, it's weird. Now during the shoot, we shoot at them and the bullets curve around the <laughs> slow ass planes. <laughs> they're which that's where they got the name. Witchcraft. Um, one of the night witches did get take a hit and ended up losing a wing. Uh, however, she was able to bail out and survive the crash. Um, they were you, over. You know, Soviet. that's like a best case scenario when you're thinking, "Oh, thank God, the wing just fell off, and I'm not just <laughs> engulfed in flames immediately." And I like the way it was worded. It said that she was able to bail out and survive the crash, but they also said they didn't have parachutes. So I imagine bail out was just like surfing the like plane crash along the ground like the silver surfer or something and then like jumping off and doing a perfect like sticking the landing yeah and um but they were over soviet territory so people on the ground had seen the fighting going on just like civilians and uh they ran over to you know help the pilot and saw that they were okay and they were cheering because they saw what the pilots had done and they offered them vodka but the pilot refused to drink, and the people couldn't understand why this man would turn down this offer. And I said, surprise, bitches. It's because it's a woman. But that was, like, the way that the story wrote the twist. Like, it, to me, it, it's written like it's supposed to be like, aha, she wouldn't drink because she is a woman. It's like, wait, women didn't drink? Like, you got to explain more to this. I don't know if, like, women weren't allowed to drink or they just didn't, didn't like drink. it. Mm. Or, yeah. But Which then I kind of was. Most women I know love vodka. 
<laughs> that's the thing. I was thinking about that. And then I was thinking, you know what? They were outnumbered 21 to 1. And they were basically flying Randy Quaid's fucking plane from Independence Day. And they still decided to engage the enemy. So, like, maybe they didn't want the vodka because they'd already, like, had a bunch before going up in the air. <laughs> you had like, to have three shots before you ever gotten one of those things. So. <laughs> but Russian shots, which were basically those, like, metal buckets. Right. That, <laughs> right. Um, so, before her death in 2013, one of the famous night witches, Nadza Popova, would give an account of the danger they'd often face. Uh, she said after... Landing the plane after a successful mission, which successful was just, you know, dropping your bombs and returning back alive. Uh, she got out of her plane and counted 42 separate bullet holes, uh, as well as holes in her map and helmet. Like, eh. wow. It's not like they're going into these places and it's like, oh, but they have this one secret upper hand where you wouldn't think they would, but they're untouchable. No, they, they're fucking sending people in like... Yeah, you're going into a fucking storm of bullets and in the right Patterson fucking plane, basically. And <laughs> but most of them are coming back alive. That just shows how good they were at what they did. Witchcraft. Um, right. <laughs> Marina Reskova, who was a woman that was like the, the, the Soviet. I always want to say Russian, but it was Soviet Union, whatever. Um, Amelia Earhart. She actually would die like on the front lines in January of 1943, so that sucks. But it made it sound like she didn't even like die in her fighter plane. They just had fucking sent her to the front lines. And this shows like the ineptitude of military, where it's like, oh, One you guys are great fighter pilots. pilots. Yeah, go to the front lines. We need more people on the front lines. It's like you're using this asset awful wrong. Yeah, like that's if you were if you were a GM, you would be fired. Uh, you'd never you'd, or you'd be put in charge of the browns for a decade but be uh, like hey whatever. you're you're a stud qb go be a defensive lineman <laughs> crap that didn't get work the, get the quarterback oh fuck so the night witches would fly their last mission on may 4th 1945 it was a mission that would take them within 37 miles of berlin just three days before germany officially surrendered so they were flying like at Pushing the front lines and flying right up literally to the end of the war. Um, by the end of the war, the 588th Regiment would become the most highly decorated Soviet air unit at, of all. You know, not just the three like regiments of women, but like they were by far the most successful and and celebrated of all the Soviet pilots. But despite this, the unit was disbanded just six months after war's end. So that's a, your typical, like, chauvinist, like, oh, man, you guys were so great. You did such a good job. But we just really can't have women in the military. Well, so you go know, home. You, I mean, you, you got to be careful. The effects on your everlasting soul when you team up with <laughs> witches. That's why we put them back in their tomb. Only to be released for the next final. That's conflict. true. I didn't look into it. It says disbanded, but by disbanded, they might mean like banished to some like Siberian Sealed. island, and right? <laughs> At where they island. still exist today, plotting their escape. If you listen real closely on the wind, you can hear them cackle as they drop bombs <laughs> on Nazis. Um, anyway, the the other real great part showing. <laughs> Attitudes just because women like they finally begrudgingly used them and they kicked ass. But uh, when the Soviets held their victory parade in Moscow, the night witches were not included, and their excuse was that their planes were deemed too slow to participate in this in the festivities. Fuck that shit! You go in circles and stay behind them. Like. <laughs> I just love the reasoning there. It's like, yeah, we won. War's over. Well, you know, one has since that the Soviets or anybody does in war like. More like you're just celebrating that it's over and you're not all under Nazi rule. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, man, these women blew up so much shit. But, like, the stuff you used to do, it is so crappy. We don't want people to see it. Like, we're we're kind of embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. Well, could, you, could you paint over it or something? Nah, that won't help. <laughs> like, just fucking tow them behind faster airplanes, I guess. <laughs> the thing you're embarrassed about is that if I, they kicked ass with pieces of shit. And you got all the good shit, <laughs> right. and you were like half the fucking soldiers they were, right? Like that's what and and is it's a crime. It should be a federal crime that there's not like a movie about these women because it. I'm pissed that I haven't itself. heard about them because you're right. right. This is a fucking great story, and 
I've and it's not never just heard like, of them. It, it, and it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you're just it's trying to be like, oh, you know, feminist, you know, this might, that doesn't make it cool just because it's like, hey, yeah, it does. Because not only did they have to overcome like everything, but they still just never got the recognition that they should have simply because of that, which right. is exactly what people are bitching about when they bitch about these issues. Which we talked but, about like, last week where it's like how so much history is like written by men central is like centralized about men and so like there's shit like this that is just not giving like the prominence it deserves like th- that's fucking crazy right now in fairness it sounds like over in well we're russia now uh it's a, a lot more well known and that these women like i said the one um or maybe i didn't say it uh, one of the more famous ones didn't die until night or 2013. So she just died five years ago and people there knew who she was and they ran, you know, media story. But it, at the same time, I don't think they knew who she was like we do most other war heroes. And then outside of Russia, like you said, I've never heard of them. Yeah. I, I, and that's true. Like, you know, if, especially uh, for America, like we don't talk a lot about like the Soviet uh, it, it, we we have this. War. I would say a weird thing, but it's a standard American thing that goes back to the birth of America. Where anytime we talk about, well, a we don't talk about World War One hardly at all, right? Probably because it was more Europe like involved. It was less like we get to be the saviors. And then when we talk about World War Two, we act like we're the ones when we're the only ones we that came in and Nazis. saved the day. Like, it's, and like, it's like we were fucking way more focused on Japan. Right. Um, it's like our involvement did help turn the tides because it helped spread the, you know, right. the, the, but it wasn't like we were the smart, like strong ones. And without us, you know, we like to act like without us, Europe would be screwed. And maybe, but not because of anything other than a numbers game. Like we turned to the numbers. And also, you know, it wasn't like a moral thing. Like really, like it was like most American wars where like the morality kind of came into play as like propaganda after the fact. Right. You know, not, not to say like we got fucking attacked. You kind of have to, your hands a little bit forced there, but it, it wasn't out of like, you know, a lot of people like have this weird fucked up narrative in their head is like, yeah, we saved the Jewish people. And like, not really. Like <laughs> that wasn't what got us to finally go, you know? No, it was. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, I, th- I thought it was a cool story and I just liked that. I came across the night witches like in October, like yeah, it's yeah. Halloween stuff. Yeah. I, like I said, it, it only would have been better if they were like actual, like actual Halloween like, witches. Yeah. <laughs> they were the rubber masks. The Nazis, yeah. But yeah, that is really cool. Um, I, I was actually a little worried when you said night witches of, and then, like, I was like, oh, shit, it's going to be, like, some dumb band or something that he likes. <laughs> the Night Witches of Brooklyn. <laughs> we only play Brooklyn! <laughs> they help define the genre of Brooklyn punk alt-bluegrass rock rap. <laughs> well, that's my favorite genre. Now I'm disappointed <laughs> that that wasn't the topic. Now I'm going to have to, when we get off here, I'm going to have to look up and see if there's any bluegrass rap. Like, I'm sure there is. It's called blue rap. <laughs> blue rap. I like <laughs> it. And if it's not a thing, we'll be back at you next week with some blue rap. <laughs> Come back next week for blue rap. I might have to, like, uh, kickstart a banjo or something because I don't have one and I can't afford one. But, uh, yeah, buy us one and, and we'll be back with something <laughs> completely different. Buy us banjos. <laughs>